So joining us on this month's local history talk is John Allen. John was president of the Devonshire Association between 2019 and 2020, um, a fine uh, association, a fine institution for um, celebrating all things Devonian, whether it's history, dialect, folklore, nature and various other things. If you're not a member of the Devonshire Association, but you're interested in anything to do with Devon, I would encourage you to join. Uh, and I'm not saying that purely because I'm also a member of the Devonshire Association. Uh, I say it because it's a very worthwhile thing to do. Anyhow, John today will be talking about the subject that you see on screen, Breton woodworkers in southwest England, round about the early to middle part of the 16th century, um, and arguing the case that there is a lot of evidence in our churches and historic buildings that we can still see today, which points to the fact that these craftspeople were uh, working around the time in the Middle Ages in Devon and Cornwall and producing some of the fine woodworking, such as the example that you can see on screen there. So without any further ado, I will pass over to you, John, and I will return at the end of the presentation. That's great. Thank you. And thank you, Jean Wilkins, who went to an awful lot of trouble to set up this particular um, lecture. We were dogged by problems with COVID earlier, but uh, finally we've made it. Let me start on a personal note. In the 1970s, I and some friends went into the church at Colebrook, and we were dazzled to see the beautiful wooden screen there of late medieval date, of which you see a detail here. Absolutely wonderful medieval carving. And we'd never seen anything quite like it. And we didn't especially think of the significance of it. But what I try and show you this afternoon is that it's one of a number of pieces of work, maybe about 20, 25 or so of them, scattered through Devon, uh, which show very strong continental connections. And I've come to the conclusion that a lot of this work was actually carved by Bretons, by people coming over, um, master craftsmen coming over from Brittany. Um, and I'll try and spell out the evidence for that. Uh, but um, there are other ways of looking at these things. Some of the work may have been done by people from Normandy or from the Low Countries. So let me try and build up my case, see if I can convince you that uh, there are good reasons for believing that uh, in the. I fuck with her and fuck with her and her. I hit up her, tell him do the her for sure. That's not me. Got him while I flew the Turks. No, the I, th I think somebody must have a right. Okay. Um, let, let's start again. Um, in the early 16th century, there is good evidence that there were large numbers of immigrants living in Devon and Cornwall. These are a forgotten people. We think of our immigrant communities um, of the 17th and 18th century, who are sometimes very celebrated. But these people back in the 16th century or back in the Middle Ages, completely forgotten, sometimes an odd modern place name um, or a, a family name like um, Britain, which tends to mean Breton rather than British, um, survives. But it comes as a real surprise to see that when you really search documents, there is evidence for a very large number of Bretons uh, living and working in uh, southwest England in the early Tudor period. And we're lucky here in Devon and Cornwall in having especially rare documentary evidence surviving. Look at this map. Um, I think that would astonish many people to realise all those different communities, there must be a hundred on the map there, in Devon and Cornwall, all had immigrants living in them in the early 16th century. Some people, of course, think that immigration is a modern phenomenon. Of course, it's not. And if you've lived uh, down in West Cornwall in the early 16th century, in the Tudor period, um, you would have found that as many as 60 people in the most 
populous parishes actually came from Brittany, 60 people, that's a very uh, marked number. And we'll see that elsewhere, um, the levels of uh, immigrant population living in the Southwest in Tudor times were actually much, much higher than they are nowadays and much more comparable to the sort of situation you might find in I don't know, Bradford or uh, a northern industrial town in, in our modern society. So that's very surprising, I think, to me and to many other people. And uh, just to remind you of uh, why these Bretons um, might find life in Western Cornwall interesting. In Western Cornwall, of course, they were still speaking Cornish and they would have been intelligible to people coming over from Brittany and Western Cornish people claimed in the prayer book rebellion, for example, they couldn't understand English. Well, maybe or maybe they could or couldn't, but they could have understood Bretons. So there would have been a very close tie between the two areas. Now, in the documentary evidence which survives for Devon and Cornwall, there is some very interesting stuff uh, arising through taxation and concerns about the uh, military safety of the country, which tell us uh, not only where these people were living, but what they were doing. And here's a table I've drawn up to show you uh, in those Western Cornish parishes you saw a moment ago, what people were actually doing. Now, um, a, a large number of these people were young, some of them aged 16, 17, 18, that sort of age. Now, uh, they weren't here uh, as students on, on sort of work experience or having a year off or anything. They were here to work. And you'll see that uh, in this table, typically uh, these young people were saving up for marriage. Uh, many of them acted as servants or laborers, as you see there, but they also worked in a range of more specialist crafts, you see weavers and millers and smiths and cord waveners and so on. And the specialists um, evidently had really uh, worthwhile skills which uh, were in demand in Devon and Cornwall. Now, some of these specialist areas which Bretons were really good at uh, were, for example, if you look down the list here, uh, cappers uh, and cord wainers, that's leather workers, and tailors. Tailors seem to have been something they were really tailoring, was something they're very good at. But uh, one of the specialist crafts which they were good at was joiners. At the bottom there, you'll see joiners or carvers, highly skilled woodworkers. And of course, their Breton names were ones which the um, taxation uh, officials often struggled with. And so they would make uh, simple names like Alex the Carver or John the Carver, as you see on the right there. Um, simple entries like that appeared in the taxation returns. So if you look on the right hand side of the screen there, what you see for evidence in Cornwall is that one, two, three, four different people were all called Carvers uh, and as a joiner here. Now, I said that these people coming over here as carvers will not have been on holiday. They will have been people who had to work or they were sent home. And it's reasonable therefore to imagine that some of their stuff, considering how many of them there were, might somehow survive uh, here in the Southwest. And indeed, when we search for evidence uh, in other sorts of documentation, we find some examples of this. So here we are, North Petherwin, which is just north of Launceston, has a nice parish church, which you'll see here. And it's one of the seven parish churches in Cornwall, for which there survive church wardens' accounts, that is, accounts which record the expenditure of the church wardens on the, the fabric of the church. So these record repairs to the roof, typically, or uh, repainting of the interior, but they also include uh, new work, including roof screens. And roof screens in the early Tudor period were going up in great numbers all over Devon and Cornwall. And here um, we see at North Petherwin that the roof screen cost what was a lot of money, 57 pounds you see paid there for 
and the rate per foot. And we actually get the names of three people who is evident from the accounts were Bretons, Papias, Weiner, Oliver. And um, uh, Oliver is a common Breton name. Um, and so we're looking here at three craftsmen who were commissioned to do the most beautiful job in the church. The reed screen was always the top job. And just a bit of it survives nowadays. Uh, the dado, that's the bit below chest height in the um, frame of the screen. You can see the uprights rising on each side of the frame. So we know that what that is what's left of a um, an early 16th century reed screen, which is the work of Bretons. Now, not all its features look very distinctively different from any other uh, work which we see in Devon and Cornwall, but there are one or two details there which we can pick up on, which um, uh, do seem distinctive. Now, um, of all the church wardens accounts surviving, I said there are just seven for Cornwall, seven parishes where we've got them. A second example at Bodmin also includes uh, Breton craftsmen doing woodwork. So two out of seven is quite a lot. Now, I want now to turn to Devon. I'm showing you Cornwall because in Cornwall, almost all the immigrants uh, in Western Cornwall especially were coming from Brittany. In Devon, things were more mixed, but Bretons formed a substantial part of the community uh, as here at Plymouth, where you see that um, uh, Breton side commemorates the place where the Bretons would have lived. I like this from the website, uh, which said, uh, um, Breton side, not an uh, endearing place to loiter, particularly when it grows dark. That's the old bus station, which since that photo was taken, uh, has been partly reconstructed. Now, these Breton names get embedded in other town names. And in London, you can see another example, Little Britain um, doesn't mean it's where the ancient Britons lived. It's where Bretons would have lived in, in Tudor times. And the same applies in Exeter. If I can move on to the next slide. If we look here at a map of Elizabethan Exeter, there was a place called Little Britain. Uh, within the walled area, down behind St Nicholas Priory, behind the side of 4th Street. And there's a second area, which you see top right on your screens, uh, which is uh, Paris Street. And we don't know firmly what the origin of the name is, but there is a likely explanation, which is that sometimes areas where there were lots of foreigners became known as um, Little Paris or um, uh, or in a case such as the street, it might have been that local people thought it was just like being in Paris, walking up and down Paris Street, because there were so many foreign tongues. So um, likely place name evidence survives in Exeter, but much more solid uh, is the evidence from the, the detailed documents which survive from the reign of Henry VIII. And here, 1522, a survey of the people who might be called up in the event of um, uh, some uh, military um, operation. So 978 people are listed for Exeter. So that's one of the best sources of uh, people's names. If you're interested in family history and you want to know whether your family was in Tudor Exeter, this is the sort of document to look at. 73 of them, almost 10% were definitely foreigners. And they came in the first instance, as you see on the left, from Brittany, Normandy, Holland, Flanders, Picardy, Brabant, Col uh, Cologne, Hesse, Cleves, even Lucca in, uh, in Tuscany. It's amazing, isn't it? You don't think of your Tudor towns as having these mixed populations, but somebody from Lombardy there as well. And a range of specialist crafts alongside servants. So lots of them were poor people and coming as servants, but there were some specialists. Some were new crafts. Book binding would have been a new thing as books became more widespread and someone had settled um, 
from Normandy with a skill in bookbinding. And there were clock makers in a, an earlier generation, shoemakers from the Netherlands, skinners. But notice that among them, there were two carvers. So we've seen evidence of uh, four carvers in Cornwall, uh, one in Ashburton, and two in Exeter so far. So we know of seven people, seven professionals doing carving for a living, all in one year, 1522. So let's leave that to one side for a moment. What you've seen is the key points. First, um, Devon and Cornwall had more immigrants living in them in Tudor times than they do nowadays. And they were a mix uh, of people. They were perhaps the equivalent of the Polish plumber who uh, uh, is um, uh, around nowadays. People who come because they had special skills and their work was in demand, or people who were looking for work at an early stage in their careers. Now, let's move on to the physical evidence. Um, you can see in this rather aging slide, uh, we're looking across to the top of South Street with um, the West Quarter beyond and Dartmoor beyond that. And you'll see that the Oxfam shop, as it is now, is indicated. That is the site uh, on which stood a richly carved early Tudor house which became known as King John's Tavern, because absolutely nothing to do with King John, it just looked old. And um, we're very lucky in having some very fine early records of what it looked like. Facade on the left, inside on the right. You see the facade is richly carved, and the inside uh, was very remarkable. Great tall hall, and on our left, galleries. Uh, now, um, Artists came to draw this hall because they realised it was something quite different from anything else to be seen, not just in Exeter, but anywhere else in southwest England. And they also recorded the outside. Actually, I'll nip back for a moment. You see the doorway on the left hand view. Bottom right, there are two figures. These were published separately in the Gentleman's Magazine in the 1830s and uh, there's the engraving. Now the house was knocked down but some components of it including these rich carvings attracted antiquaries and others who hung on to things and um, most of the carving, in fact all of the main pieces, was believed to be lost until quite recently when a colleague of mine, another historic buildings person called John Thorpe. So you may know John, he has recorded listed buildings in the Crediton area and elsewhere. He was in the Metropolitan Museum in New York when he spotted the carvings which flank the engraving. And I hope you can see that um, the one on the right is actually the same uh, carving as the engraving beside it. And the same with the one, uh, the inner one of the two on the left. So suddenly it became apparent that some of this uh, house actually survived. And let's have a look at them. When the Metropolitan Museum bought these in the early 1970s, they did say believing they were the finest examples of late medieval English wood carving on the market. And they're lovely, aren't they? This is a jester with his jester's stick and his ass's um, head. He's wearing um, a, a cap with ass's ears sticking out of it and his bells and so on. Um, and here, this is a wonderful carving of a scold who is thrashing her husband, got him by the hair and is whacking him. Now, they're wonderful carvings, but there is a place where they can be paralleled. There isn't really anything quite like them in England, but there is abroad, and the place to look for these things is Morlaix, um, which is directly south of Plymouth, as anyone will know who's been on holiday to Brittany on Brittany ferries and gone to Roscoff, which is the point 
just up above Morlay, on the Bay of Morlay. Now, Morlay was a very important trading partner for the Devon ports. And um, from there, large amounts of canvas were uh, uh, exported to Devon, for example. And we had lively exchange with them, but um, rather in the manner of modern French and English fishermen, there were also periodic outbreaks of violence uh, where everyone fell out. And you can see this to this day in Morlay, because in 1522, the English uh, went over after a particular dispute and burnt part of Morlay. And after it, the town was rebuilt. And many of the houses which you see as a modern visitor were actually built immediately after the 1522 raid uh, and fire which followed it. And when you go to Morlay nowadays, you always hear about this famous incident when the English went over and burnt the place. Um, and you always hear the story of how the English got drunk when they found the cellars full of wine underneath some of the merchants' properties. Um, but what you don't hear is the basic fact that um, Brittany and Devon and Cornwall relied heavily on, on each other as partners in trade. So although there were periodic moments of violence, um, there were also behind the scenes, long periods, less celebrated in their history, uh, when they um, traded with each other. Morlay is the most fantastic town to visit. And um, imagine some, perhaps many of you know it, because it's just stuffed with historic houses, over a hundred timber frame buildings. And we're going to look at a couple of those next. Um, and here we've had the benefit uh, of a couple of marvellous books uh, by um, a an architectural historian named Daniel Lelou, there you see his name on the left, who's written a book called La Maison d'Urbaine en Trégor, um, the urban house in the Diocese of Tréguier, um, centred around Morlay. And the second book on the right there, um, full of beautiful photographs. And I'll say these Breton um, towns, which didn't undergo industrialization in their equivalent of the Victorian period, it's still full of fantastic stuff. Um, so these um, Morlay towns, uh, sorry, houses have been studied in detail. And a particular thing which emerged from this was that the houses of Morlay, the richest of them, and uh, many of those rebuilt after the 1522 fire, were built in a particular style. Um, and they're called in Breton di dialect, Maison à Pont d'Alais, with a hard Z at the end, which means Pont d'Alais, bridges of going, if you uh, go with a lot stiff translation. What's special about them is that they had a fantastic display hall in the middle of the house. On our left hand side, you see um, three superimposed galleries, which all look into great tall space running up through the middle of the house and uh, this was the defining feature of these houses so they're designed for long narrow tenements in which um, you build high walls on each side of your house and then you raised up the roof above them so very very distinctive house forms and these are often very wealthy houses there on the right, you can see a nobleman's house. This is um, a, a very costly textile made in the Low Countries, possibly in Brussels around 1500. And now in the, that beautiful museum in Paris, which again, some of you may have found and visited the Cluny Museum in the suburbs of Paris. And um, there's arithmetic um, personified, doing her sums, counting her money, um, and that we know that that tapestry uh, hung in one of these houses. Now that tapestry is huge and it would have been a very, very costly item. So just to uh, reiterate, 
in Morlaix, in northern Brittany, there was a very distinctive form of house, which is unique to Morlaix itself, and which was particularly associated with very high ranking people. Now, when we come to look at those houses, I hope I can persuade you that they are actually very similar indeed to King John's Tavern, the demolished Exeter house. So there is a link between Morlaix and Exeter. On the right, you see how they do frontages in Morlaix. Can you see the way these timbers, these blocks of timbers are done? They're just the same at Exeter. And at Exeter, you have sculptures. I'm not sure whether you'll be seeing uh, my cursor in your screens or not, but if you can follow my cursor, you see on the left and right of the frontage on your left hand side, the King John Tavern drawing, there are sculptures in just the same places as there are in Morlaix houses. Moreover, the way in which the house is built is um, like the one on the left in which um, the uh, stonework rises in a straight line and timber sticks out from it. That's a house in Morlaix. Uh, these are Devon houses where instead of sticking out the timber work, they project out the, the they corbel out in stone, and project out the party walls with overhanging corbels. There we are, you know, Laura Ashley's in Exeter. Uh, that's the Devon way of doing it. On our left, the Breton way of doing it. Now, just briefly, I mustn't talk too long on this particular subject, but if we go back to those sculptures, which are now in New York in the Metropolitan Museum, the fool, the jester on the far left here, the brown one, is very similar indeed to the style uh, of this carving in the middle of your screen of um, a, a jester in Anne of Brittany's house in Morlaix. It's amazingly similar. Um, the same theme, the same style of shoes and, and so on, same knobbly knees. And um, whereas on the right, we've got the other type of carving you get in Morlaix, which is sacred carving or carving to do um, with quaint Breton things. This is a Cornish, uh, sorry, a Breton bourdon, Breton bagpipe being played. So the theme of the Exeter House, uh, jesters, um, fits in with what was being done in Brittany. And so does the, the character of the carving. Now, when we go inside, I hope it's apparent to you that our extra house on the right with its spiral stair is really like the Anna Brittany house on the left. So that's the one standing in Morlaix nowadays on the left. That's the one in extra on the right. And the way the stair is done is very, very similar indeed. So um, you remember these are unique to Morlay. Um, we might wonder, how was this done? Did a Morlay craftsman carve it all in Brittany, um, put it on a boat and send it over to Exeter? What's sometimes called the flat pack theory. Very unlikely. You'd need to be taking measurements all the time just to make sure that your staircase was gonna fit in the space where it belonged. It's almost certain in truth that that staircase in Exeter must have been done by an, a Breton woodworker um, who'd come over to do the job. And just to make the point about these staircases, they have been taken out of Morlaix and sometimes you can see them in museums. And here are two examples, the V&A in London on the left uh, and the place I haven't visited, St. Louis, um, Mississippi in the USA. The art museum there has got completely stripped out from a Morlay property, a complete reconstruction as they used to do them of one of these houses. So um, they are a very, very distinctive architectural type, which um, has made its way into the museums of the world. Now, if I haven't persuaded you that they really are similar, compare these two. Can you say the, the panelling, this is called linen fold, uh, and the way in the positioning of the sculpture, St. George on our left, 
uh, from the Exeter House, the different uh, bishop saints on the right, um, is, is very similar indeed. And we could look at other details. King John's Tavern on the left, uh, a detail from an Exeter, uh, sorry, from a Morley House on the right, and then Swooping Angels. Excuse me. We know that King John's Tavern had sweeping angels. We can see them top right. And you see these also in Brittany, as in a church uh, not far from Morlaix, but down at the bottom right. Um, I've just said to you that the context of these, these houses in Morlaix is the fire of 1522, when all the houses in the right hand view were uh, rebuilt. And you can see them in the town plan of Morlaix because they're very regular. You can see these blocks outlined in green in my uh, left hand view. So the Exeter House is so similar to these houses at Morlaix that I'm saying I think it must have been built by a Morlaix craftsman. And on the whole, um, people I've tried to persuade have thought this is a reasonable case. Now, so to conclude on that first section, a Morley craftsman came to Exeter and uh, supervised, uh, undertook the carving of a complete house, which was uh, finally demolished in Exeter in the 1830s. Next, I want to look at three screens where I think we can see that uh, Breton craftsmen have been at work in Devon. But before I turn to them, let me point out to you what a traditional Devon screen looks like. It's that lovely screen at Bobby Tracy. It's got a gallery at the top. Um, it's got perpendicular style windows, as it were. And below them, a, da a dado, excuse me, a lower uh, carved wooden uh, series of panels with painted saints. That's what they all tend to look like, something like that. Beautiful work, but quite um, distinctive. Um, and, and actually there are almost a hundred examples which survive like this, um, but with these basic characteristics, uh, vaulting at the top, perpendicular, tracery in its windows and this style of um, data at the bottom. Now, for more than a century, it's been known since late Victorian times that there are three Devon churches which are completely different and where the tracery doesn't look anything like the conventional Devon tracery. Here's a field trip which I took to Colbrook Church uh, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago. And you can see that at Colbrook, they have these absolutely fantastic panels, which are just completely different from the normal way they do things. While we're there, let's have a look at these posts at the top, which are sort of weird because they don't line up with the uprights below them. They're all squiffy. Um, now, there's where I started the screen at were very beautiful. And here's another one. Uh, that chapel on one side of the choir at Col Colbert has this whole series of beautiful, beautiful panels. And these are all carved in oak, very delicate and, and attractive things. Now, um, there are two other places where these occur. This is Coldridge where there's been a lot of recent attention around Christmas. If you uh, read newspapers, you would have read that um, a group of people have decided that Coldridge is sort of full of clues, which tell us that one of the princes uh, of the, in the tower, supposedly murdered by Richard III, um, uh, was secretly hidden away at Coldridge. And this church has got lots of clues to show this. Well, it's bold. But um, our immediate interest is this screen, uh, which has got more of these beautiful panels of uh, what is called lace work. 
you see this sort of stuff here, just as we've seen. And when we look at the uprights, they have these twirly barley twist columns, which you also see a lot in Brittany. There's a third instance of these churches, um, which is the church at Brushford, where, as you can see here, um, they have further examples of this very delicate work, which is called dantel work in Brittany, lace work. Now, in Brittany, uh, it is a distinctive style, um, which you get in certain very rich screens, of which this is the most famous, San Fiacre, um, the little chapel to San Fiacre at Lufauet, which um, is in central Brittany, uh, is one of the great treasures of medieval art in France, um, still immaculately preserved. And when you have a look at the detail, um, you can see the kind of skill which this Breton wood carver had. Now, that's the most famous of the Breton screens, but a few others survive. And uh, the connection between them and these Devon churches, the three Devon churches, was explored by two friends, one a former friend of mine, Charles Tracy and Chris Brooks, about 20 years ago. And they, and Chris was rather keen on the flat pack theory that there was a Breton connection, he agreed, but he thought perhaps the Bretons had uh, sent over um, some woodwork which had been reassembled in these Devon churches. Well, Tracy, on the other hand, also agreed that there were continental signs in these uh, Devon churches, and he thought perhaps there'd been a mix of Devon and continental things. And I too was interested about that time, and I thought, you know, these would make some nice holidays. So my wife Jill and I, over the following 10 years or so, went back and forth to Brittany maybe a dozen times or so, looking at all the Breton evidence. And some of it is fabulous, look at this. Um, I sometimes say to people, this is the church to go to to appreciate what a rude loft would look like. Nowadays in England, we never see rude lofts, they're all taken down, um, or we see fragments of them in just a few places. But you can see how the rood completely dominates the church. Very plain, quite small church, apart from that one piece of woodwork. This is Kerfons, um, which is up in northern Brittany, uh, near Lagnon. Lovely, lovely work. Completely different in style from the one which we've looked at a moment ago. And here's another one, Notre Dame de Lombardier, um, between um, uh, Morlay and Roscoff with this incredible carving. Isn't that amazing? Ch again, just a chapel, not even the parish church, um, with this lovely woodwork. So here you can see this Dantem tell work, this lace work uh, in Brittany. Here's another example, Le Canvel, um, with this very, very delicate work and with panelling. Now, um, there's a, another example, just the odd one of these churches is actually derelict now. And this one we had to squeeze into, sort of semi break into, and water has been running down the front of that, it's rotting, terribly sad. Um, but again, you see all these panels. Now let's compare the Devon ones at the top there with the Breton ones at the bottom. I hope it's obvious. Although all the motifs change in every instance, the overall similarity is very, very strong. And I think there's really no doubt that it was a Breton who carved those panels at, at Colebrook. So that I think is clear. What we didn't understand until spending a lot more time looking at it was that the way they're made is by, um, the Bretons used laminated wood plywood, if you like, stuck together. And sometimes it falls off. There it is falling off in Brittany. This carving should go up beyond that point. But uh, the uh, top layer of carving has fallen off here. You see the same at Colebrook. 
In other words, it's not just the little fancy panels which are press on, it's the way the whole thing is actually built, which, which is, and here, um, another example, there's the uh, doorway at Brushford. I mentioned Brushford in Mid-Devon, um, just north of Copplestone on the Biddeford Road. Um, can you see these flat bits reflect the fact that the top layer of decoration has fallen off? And the same with these spirals that you see in both places. So what I came to realise was um, it's the whole screen which is paralleled uh, in these three Devon shows. It's not just the ornamental panels which might have been shipped over as bits of decoration to be put up in um, England. And uh, here at the bottom uh, picture, Loch Anvel, um, right in the heart of the Breton countryside, a long way from anywhere actually, um, these finials are just like the ones which we see at Colebrook here and Coldridge top right. So um, very, very clear links that these are basically exotic bits of art placed in our Devon churches. Moreover, it's not just uh, screens which were carved for these Devon churches, but at Colebrook, there is a little thing, a predia, a place where you kneel um, uh, at prayer. And it's got a very funny looking uh, carving on the left here. And this fellow with a club with all these scales and the Pevsner volume, for example, the um, guide to Devon churches, marvellous books, Devon uh, Pevsners. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very odd looking carving. Well, it is. But what we didn't realise when Pevsner came out, there's our uh, Colebrook carving. He actually is a, a version of what we see at that church of Loch Anvel, um, something from Breton mythology, the scaly and hairy creatures who lived in the woods. Wood woeses is a vernacular name for them in England. And they were shown having clubs. You can see there's got a club. You can see there's a hairy man wood woes and a hairy woman wood woes in this one. Um, so very kind of strange beings, that's what's shown at Colebrook. So not only the screens, but some of the other furniture was done by Bretons. Now, I hope you've been persuaded that, uh, just to run through it again, you've seen one extra house which was built by a Breton. You've seen three Devon screens, which I'm saying, uh, must have been built by Bretons. But there are also other works of art in Devon which show connections to them. And here's an example. This is Kingsbridge, where this flaming tracery is unique to Devon screens. And these twisted shafts with pellets uh, and these uh, panels at the bottom, they're all very strongly continental. I think that's another work, certainly by foreign craftsmen, probably by Bretons. Here's another example at Ugbra, you know, um, sort of South Hands. Uh, you can see this fine screen. When you go around and look at the back of it, you can see these uh, nice panels, linen fold panels, just like the ones we saw in Brittany. Uh, and there are other details like the, um, the way that it's made of laminated wood you see the shaft goes up stops and it's broken off here um, that's a sign that it's made of plywood and this the most amazing this is Holton down in the South Hams fantastic screen uh, early 16th century and people have always known this as exotic people have thought maybe it's Spanish um, or maybe it's uh, done by craftsmen from the Low Countries I think it's North French, uh, and this is the context in which that was where it was done. Uh, and once you get your eye in, um, there are other examples here. This is Modbury, uh, where the pulpit is very much in the same style uh, with fleur de lis, as if tell us here. 
And this little detail, um, I'm imagining you're seeing my cursor, the framing to the rectangular panel is also uh, very closely related to Cole Brook. One of the interesting things about these Bretons is that they may have known about the Renaissance slightly before our um, main Devon people did. Uh, here's a case in point. If you go to Tiverton, there's a carved door which has got Renaissance detail, this sort of stuff, at a surprisingly early date, about 1520, earlier than you're seeing the Renaissance, say, in the palaces of Henry VIII. Here at Totnes, more detail, which is very like the things in Morlaix. And I think they're probably, less certainly, I suppose, but probably examples of Breton craftsmanship, but certainly of craftsmanship by people who'd seen continental woodwork. Now, when we get up into North Devon, there is some fantastic stuff to see. This is Swimbridge, where Rising above the font, there is a, an octagonal box, which has got lovely carved panels. We can't ever say, I think we'll never say, that the, the panels were imported, or whether they were the work of a craftsman working locally, but there is quite a lot of uh, this high quality continental style work in North Devon. On balance, I think it's more likely it was made here rather than elsewhere, but it's hard to be sure. But isn't that fabulous? Um, incredibly delicate, and lively um, panels in the early Renaissance style. And here, another example of Pilton. And I remember taking a French furniture expert. He's a specialist in 16th century French furniture. He looked at this and he said, well, if that was on a panel of French furniture, you'd never tell that it wasn't the real thing, as it were. And um, that's very typical of work of its period done by good uh, French carvers. But it turns up in, in the church at Pilton. So there's another instance where these people are getting around. We might also ask, and I'm starting to wrap up this um, lecture now, to say, well, are Devon and Cornwall unique in this way, or were there other places? There are other examples. Devon and Cornwall have got the most numerous examples recognised to date, but there was similar comparable work in Dorset and Hampshire, but also in Oxfordshire and to some extent in South East England, and the sorts of spiral shafts or ornamented shafts we've been looking at in Brittany also turn up in Oxfordshire, that's tame, Excuse me, my cold tea is just being drunk. Uh, and Charlton and Oxmoor is also in Oxfordshire. So there are other examples of this work around, but um, to my mind, it's in Devon and Cornwall where you see the most of it, and where we've got this interesting combination of good documents and several, to my mind, very convincing examples of Breton work. Let me wrap this up by saying, when I give these talks, um, I'm sort of aware that they have much more of a kind of contemporary ring about them with this whole debate about immigration that's been going on and Brexit and heaven knows what over the last 10 years or 20 years, more so than when I started. Uh, what it amounts to, I think, is that a, a sizable fraction of uh, the finest work which survives in our churches uh, in Devon and Cornwall wasn't actually done by Devon and Cornwall people at all, but by skilled immigrants. And these artists, I mean, it's not known that people like Vanbrugh or um, in, the, in the 17th century, Hobine and so on, came uh, from the Netherlands because uh, the Netherlands produced a lot of very, very good craftsmen and, and engravers and so on. The same is true, I think, of our area, but it's never been picked up on previously. So I've made a case this evening, uh, uh, this afternoon, that um, in Devon and Cornwall, we have some wonderful works which have long been recognised as terrific pieces of 
uh, late medieval art, but they're actually done by Bretons and possibly some of them by people from Normandy or, or the Low Countries. So that, that's the first thing. Um, but my second thing, just in conclusion, is I hope you've um, seen things which might make you think, oh, it'd be nice to see that. And that when the su summer picks up, you might like to go to uh, Colebrook or Coldridge or Brushford, um, those three churches, and they are normally open. There's a lot of problems nowadays with churches which are closed, but you can expect those. You can certainly expect that at Coldridge at the moment, because since all this publicity about the um, lost prince who might have ended up living his life uh, at Coldridge in, the, in early Tudor times, there have been floods of people coming to Coldridge. So I hope as, as well as hearing the lecture today, you might like to follow it up um, by uh, making a church visit. And of course, on a general point, our churches are just full of wonderful art, which is still a little appreciated. People go to art galleries or museums to look at art very often. The place to look is churches, that above every other place. In, in Britain is where to see art. And some of it is of a high order uh, of, of beauty um, and, and a tremendous joy. So just on that note, I'll conclude saying, hope it's persuaded you uh, to go church visiting. Thank you. Thank you, John. I, I think you make a very strong case for the uh um the evidence for for breton wood working certainly far stronger a case probably than um one of the princes of the tower ending up down here there's possibly um a bit too much da vinci code being read still for for that to uh, to be the case i don't know i don't want to pass judgment on uh on such an idea but i i suspect your evidence for breton woodworking is is far more um uh, far more likely to be the case. Um, there's some very interesting stuff there, actually. I, I, I think it's getting out into churches and looking for this stuff is, is, is certainly still a worthwhile exercise, isn't it? It's very much a detective story. And, you know, even the fact that um, those carvings turning up in the Met um, from Exeter, at the very least, show that there's still evidence to be found or, or rediscovered, isn't there? Indeed, indeed. And um, our churches are so rich with things no one has really ever pursued. And obviously, I'm not going to do it in my lifetime, but there are a thousand stories in our Devon churches uh, on all sorts of levels, family stories, um, stories about particular works of art and so on, um, which will provide fascination for generations of historians. And sometimes I look at this and I think, you know, you only just really started scratching the surface there's so much there which has never really been appreciated uh, yeah i think that's that's true in all aspects of our history and heritage isn't it um i've i've uh, amended the security settings for the room so hopefully if people want to um turn on their cameras and join you in the room they should Lovely. be able shall to I do stop, so now shall i stop screen sharing yes and we can all yes please do thank you um if you've got a question for John, please do pop it in the chat or uh, just indicate by um, using one of the Zoom methods of raising your hand or, or waving frantically at the screen or whatever you want to do. There was a question very early on from Hal in the chat who, who asked the question, if Cornwall specialised in certain occupations, why were there so few? but then followed it up with a comment, it just dawned on me that the number includes Bretons in Cornwall with such occupations, which might then explain it. Yeah, I think perhaps I could pick up on this. Um, early Tudor Devon and Cornwall experienced a massive rise in their economy, which was all connected to cloth making and to a lesser extent to tin, which also went through a boom in early Tudor times. And um, the devout parishes of Devon and Cornwall sunk an unbelievable amount of money into church building. So when we think of Devon, 500 medieval churches, and, and also hundreds of medieval chapels which have vanished, you know, when you tot it up around the southwest, 
uh, Cornwall getting on for 300 churches, Somerset another, I think 400 or so. You can see the 2000 churches there, which uh, many of them are wanting new things, especially fancy new furniture and carving. So there must have been great demand. And it was, you know, in quite large part, uh, satisfied by local craftsmen. But people always love exotic things, don't they? And I haven't explained that. At, at Cold Brook, as a local family, the Copplestons were very wealthy. And uh, it was one of the Copperston family who'd organized the tax returns for Henry VIII's reign. So you can imagine he was well off. Um, and a leading person. And I think they looked for exotic things. You didn't want to look like everyone else if you could avoid it. If you're the king, it, you were expected to produce something which would dazzle that no one else had seen. But even at the local level, that was true. And I think that's probably part of the story why um, immigrant craftsmen had a bit of uh, cutting edge on local people. Thank you. Um, there's a, um, a point from Isabel here. So, uh, uh, Isabel says, I'm completely convinced and will be visiting the churches. Thank you. That was so interesting. I had no idea there had been a Maison and Pondelet in Exeter. What a shame it was pulled down. Uh, Isabel also goes on to ask, have you any evidence of this type of work in Exeter Cathedral? In the cathedral? Now, there's a thing. I've never seen it, but some of the big churches do have you know right across southern England some of the big churches have got examples of renaissance style work but we don't at Exeter and you can imagine since I'm the cathedral archaeologist I've been looking out for it keenly um yeah that's the thought we just don't seem to have this but we've got nice early 16th century work of a just slightly earlier generation I suspect uh, I'm just going to interject and throw in on the subject of Exeter Cathedral because it seems like a good time to do so at this point, um, a future talk which we've got coming up. Uh, so after uh, after the local history talks take a summer break um, in, in a, a month or two's time, uh, we'll be carrying on hosting monthly talks uh, on historical subjects sometimes, but not necessarily tied to Devon, uh, but with speakers from further afield. And in June, we have a talk um, from uh, award-winning buildings archaeologist um, James Wright from Triskley Heritage, who's going to be talking on the subject of medieval stonemasons uh, following from quarry to medieval architecture. Um, there's a link there because this event is live now on our Eventbrite page. Um, and James will be talking um, about Exeter Cathedral and the medieval stonework architecture of it as part of that talk so if that does interest you if Exeter Cathedral is your thing um, then do sign up for that talk and I've just popped a link to it in the chat there that's way ahead in June but these things do um, fill up so feel free to book whenever you like right let's move to the room itself then uh, Tony I think you had your hand up virtually speaking first go for it thank you Thank you, John. That, that, that was a great talk. So lo lots of strands in there, which interests me. One of which is about whether you, you have any indication as to whether these, uh, these Breton uh, craftsmen continue to live in, in Devon for long periods of time or were just sort of here doing the odd commission. I think, for example, that uh, I, I know here in Crediton, we have at least one man who appears in several different uh, returns, things like May subsidies and what have you, uh, through the 16th century. He's, he's a man, he, he, he's very confusing because he's sometimes referred to as Garrett Aslin and sometimes refer, referred to as Aslin Garrett. Oh, interesting. Uh, now, the Garretts are uh, usually thought to be Dutch immigrants. Is that what you believe? Well, the Garretts just... in London in the immigrant community and uh, we have them in Exeter in the Elizabethan period as well. At the end of Elizabeth's reign, there's another collection of um, continental style, very trendy, up-to-date work uh, with the Mannerist tradition that comes in at the end of Elizabeth's reign. And it's classy stuff. And it's connected to a different group of immigrants uh, who 
uh, include the family you call Garrett. So it's a very familiar name to me. And interesting, you've picked up on that one. The answer regarding these Bretons is um, we can see that some of them were here at least for several decades, but they weren't allowed to own property. And, and that might not have been too serious a problem because lots of people didn't own their own houses, even very wealthy people. Uh, didn't go for the modern style of house ownership, um, but you weren't allowed to, so that would be a restriction on you. But of course, while they're very welcome here, and it, I think it's great when you hear all these stories of immigration and how badly it sometimes worked out in Devon, the picture which I have and which Marianne Kowaleski, the um, American professor who's been chasing up late medieval immigration, is that actually they were absorbed, they, it went down very well, and they um, became often quite, you know, some of them became moderately wealthy, some of them took on officials' roles in towns, and it all worked, worked out swimmingly until at the end of Henry VIII's reign, um, England fell out with France, and the Bretons were by that time part of the French um, uh, state, and suddenly they became, um, what was the phrase? Um, Persona non grata. <laughs> well, absolutely, yes. And there was a great phrase. Um, they were members of a, a foreign, a, 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 a hostile power, anyway, that was the point. And they were booted out. And um, just as there were race riots in, you know, in other periods, by that time in London, there was a huge community of low countries people, and um, French, a very, very mixed community. Um, and uh, the French ones were booted out. So we just suddenly never hear of them again. And they were given a miserable amount of time to get out of the country, a fortnight or something. So there must have been terrible stories associated with that, which of course have never been written down. Yeah. So it's for that reason that these are um, forgotten people. You know, that there, there, there aren't, well, there are very few successors. As I say, people called um, John Britton and so on, there are, you, you come across that surname sometimes, must be amongst those who, who didn't go, go home. But um, there'd been Bretons in Exeter for hundreds of years before this. We know of them in the 13th century. We know of Italians living in Exeter in the Norman period and so on. Um, so our cities were much more mixed. You know, I think we all remember a granny who never traveled more than 10 miles. And I think that's our kind of mental impression of what the past was like, that most people didn't travel far, but it's not, not true. Lots of people did travel around. It, it, I, with regard to, to, uh, to, to Mr. Garrett or Mr. Aslin, whichever he is, I, I'm pretty sure, I'd have to go back to my notes, I'm pretty sure he's actually identified as a Breton in, in at least one- Well, version. I never, well, there we are. I, I've got a great case, which I can sort of share with you in a similar way, which is, in Dartmouth, there's a case of a Breton, how did it go? It was a um, Breton um, apprentice who was working for a Low Countries uh, master in an English port. So what would that have looked like? Would it look Breton, um, you know, Dutch or English, who knows? Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Oh, thank you, John, that's very helpful. Thanks, Tony. There's a question from Anne in the chat, which I'll come to in a moment, but Jean, you were going to ask a question first, I believe. I, I, actually, it was me, but uh, it was almost identical question to that which Tony uh, asked as to whether there were generations of Breton carvers in Exeter or not. But uh, well, I think we've just about got the answer for that one already. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you. In that case, uh, Anne's question in the chat was, how many of these immigrants were female? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, and of course, you've got a lopsided view because uh, taxation records um, generally, you know, will list the head of the family. There would have, there were some, and I'd, I've come across a handful, but they, yeah, they're much harder to pin down because they tend not to be the person who's being um, uh, taxed. But that said, some of the Cornish ones are, um, and, and some of them are quite young people, aged 13, 14, as young as that. 
Thank you. It's just a note from Paul as well. Oliver is still a significant name in the Hale area of West Cornwall. Right. Yes. Right. Interesting. I think, yeah. And in, in Brittany, the form of the name is, is often Olivier, but of course it gets ironed out in Cornwall to Oliver. So, yeah, interesting. Excellent. Thank you. Um, in just a moment, I will uh, let people know what's coming up next month and one or two other uh, bits and pieces. Um, does anybody have a last minute question for John that they would like to throw in before I move on and do that? Yes, Jean. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much to John. Um, it's the second time he's given folk in Newton St. Sires a talk. Um, he did come to the village and he was talking about the bishop's throne and he um, even took us on a little tour in the fields and uh, so he is known in Newton St. Sires and thank you very very much John. It was I think it was your choice Jean in fact wasn't it that you thought this might be interesting. I gave you one or two right thoughts and you plucked this one out and thought it might make a nice talk so there we are thank you uh, i have a personal interest i had a grandfather who was a wood carver right. with, with a, Britain. <laughs> he was a very with an unusual surname that was thought to be french but i think he would have been sent his family would have been sent off packing <laughs> yes. yeah, many yeah. years before Perfect. In that case, maybe everybody else would like to also join Jean in um, showing your Zoom related thanks in whatever medium you choose to uh, John for that fascinating presentation and Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you for looking after me. That's great. And you, Jean.